Welcome to the Biobalance Healthcast, episode number 408, Testosterone Pellets and the Illnesses of Aging. Biobalance Healthcast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of Biobalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Dr. Maupin and Brett are the authors of The Secret Female Hormone, the seminal work about hormone replacement therapy for women, which is available on Amazon or from Dr. Maupin's office at BioBalance Health. Dr. Maupin's office is currently accepting new patients. We talk all the time about preventing the illnesses of aging, and I'm not sure that we do we attend as much to identifying what those illnesses are. Mm-hmm. Everybody knows that you get older, you start to break down, and eventually you die. Mm-hmm. Uh, and for a lot of times, especially for women, over the last 30 years, doctors would say to women, you're just getting old. That is what happens get when used you get to it. old. Yeah. Get used to it. <laughs> uh, they said that because they didn't know any better. And but the children of the 70s aren't listening to that. <laughs> and they shouldn't because now there are there are things known that mm-hmm. work to help and testosterone pellet hormone replacement therapy mm-hmm. are among those things that are known and that help. Mm-hmm. But there's a learning curve or lag time for a lot of practicing physicians who've been out there for a long time who haven't updated their repository of knowledge. That's true, and not all of this information is in their journal. Right. So I guess the the biggest issue with getting information to your doctor is that your doctor reads GYN journals or reads endocrine journals or reads um, rheumatology yeah rheumatology yeah. journals but they don't read the other journals that are out there so the testosterone research is spread among all the all of the journals so they may not put all that together as this is what causes all of these diseases and maybe we can roll back the roll back the clock mm-hmm. and make people better by replacing these hormones instead we're taught as doctors as MDs not necessarily DOs they're more preventive but MDs are taught here's a disease give this medicine and delay the death that would be caused by this or or just stop the suffering or don't even stop the suffering just stop the progression of the disease so we're not taught prevention and I never really thought about the d- diseases that we are talking about today, like osteoporosis. I know that's a disease of aging, but I n- never thought, oh, that only happens when we get older. That's true. We don't get heart disease when we're young unless we were born with a heart, a heart problem. We don't have rheumatoid arthritis. We don't get uh, autoimmune diseases until after 40 unless we have childhood autoimmune diseases, and that's a whole different thing. So, I mean, many of these illnesses, dementia, Alzheimer's, they're all diseases of aging. So what is the trigger? What starts this? It's not just another year older. Well, but you belong to two different international medical associations Mm -hmm. that have conventions every six months or so Mm -hmm. where doctors come and present their research. And and the the thing you that you didn't learn about that in medical school, but what Mm -hmm. you learned in medical school is that you have to keep learning. You have yes. to keep looking, keep inquiring, keep saying, why does this happen and what can we do about it? Be curious. And and at these conventions, doctors talk about, we're looking at these things and this is what we're finding. Mm-hmm. And here's the research that we base our conclusions on. And then you take that information and you come home and you say, well, can I apply that in my practice? Can mm-hmm. I apply that with the patients that I have? Mm-hmm. Uh, whether it's peptides or testosterone mm-hmm. pellets or some other activity or ingredient. Peptides are um, groups of amino acids that stimulate growth hormone. So what we really boil the whole thing down to with aging is that two hormones decrease as we get older that actually trigger illnesses. Mm -hmm. And that is testosterone drops and then growth hormone drops. And those two hormones usually our drop, the low level of those hormones is the trigger for all of the aging processes built into our body and then the diseases that come after it. Mm -hmm. So I'm praying for the day when 
patients go to their internal medicine doctor or their family doctor and they say, oh, you're 50, let's check your testosterone. Oh, it's low. Let's replace it so you don't get all these other diseases. So we can put me out of business, basically. <laughs> yeah. You know, so because we would make a huge inroad in all of the diseases that are are just plaguing Americans and I mean everyone in the, in the world that gets that old. But Americans is my most my most um, important um, patient group. But I but basically, if we could prevent that, and we could then because we feel good on testosterone and growth hormone or or the stimulation for growth hormone, the peptides, then we'd have enough energy to exercise. And I mean, most of my patients go, I feel great. I'm exercising again or eat right or consider the fact that they should eat better. They're not as tired and lethargic as they are when they don't have testosterone. Right. And they're not, and, and they're not motivated when they lose their testosterone. They just sit and, I mean, I, when they say I'm not motivated, I'm like, so does that mean you sit and look at the wash instead of folding it? Or does that mean that you don't want to go to work. I mean, it, you know, that yeah. kind of thing. Is How bad is it? Right. How and then we it? discuss how much better it is when they come back. So when you talk about the diseases of aging that can be impacted in a positive way, or an avoidance way, mm -hmm. uh, tell me about diabetes because we've been doing a lot of conversations about the epidemic of obesity mm -hmm. and the epidemic of diabetes too mm -hmm. uh, in America. Type 2 diabetes. Yeah. So mm -hmm. talk to me about that and testosterone replacement. So testosterone works several ways to combat or prevent diabetes. Okay. Testosterone builds muscle. Muscle is the organ in your body that burns calories. So if you have more muscle, you can burn more calories, and therefore you don't get as obese. You don't gain fat. The other thing is estrogen and testosterone decrease insulin resistance. That means... Insulin resistance is ins there's a lot of insulin, more than there should be every time you eat something. And instead, uh, what insulin does is it carries blood sugar to your cells and ushers it into the cell. It, it's a way of getting in to like a vehicle into the cell. So when um, insulin takes your blood sugar and goes to your cell and you have insulin resistance, it bounces off. And where does it land? It lands where there's fat. So it makes more fat. It can't get in the cell and make energy. So you get tired and you make more fat, even though that one thing you ate wasn't really the calories that should make you make fat. You make fat anyway because you're right. insulin resistant. Right. So testosterone improves the porousness of the cell. And oftentimes we have to help the testosterone in the beginning with metformin or something else to help it help people get a reaction to their testosterone faster so mm -hmm. they don't have to wait so long to get weight loss or fat loss. So, so it, it can, works on on weight loss. It works on insulin resistance. It works on building muscle. So it can and help you avoid becoming diabetic. Right. And if you have become diabetic, it can help you find your way back to the other side. Yes. Without medicine. Without type, uh, type 2 diabetes. Insulin shots. By losing weight. Now, if you have a mixture of type 1 and type 2, it's not right. as good at that. At that. Mm -hmm. Or if you have type 1, it's not. Type 1 patients usually don't have to lose weight. That's not really going to affect their diabetes. They've had an autoimmune reaction to their um, islet cells that make insulin, so they have very low insulin. Mm -hmm. is type so one it's the a same different thing. thing. As, as juvenile diabetes, is that what we. Yes, used we used to that. call it, yes, type 1 is juvenile diabetes, but now we see it in adults sometimes. In adults as well. Yes, yeah, it's from, auto, from an autoimmune kind of standpoint. Mm -hmm. So we're talking type 2 diabetes and testosterone. So other issues of health and aging that frequently become a focus of attention are people suffering from depression mm -hmm. that's chronic, uh, people mm -hmm. suffering from anxiety that really frightens them in terms of, I, I don't know why I'm doing this, mm -hmm. and I don't know what to do about it. Do you have evidence that says testosterone mm -hmm. replacement can help people reduce or avoid occurrences of depression or anxiety? Yes. We have a lot, we ha we have a lot of research that shows that depression that, is, that starts as we get older, after 40, mm -hmm. uh, in both men and women, 
can be secondary to a loss of testosterone. Testosterone is a mood elevator. It's not that just people like like to have their testosterone back to normal because they want their muscle. They feel better. They have a better attitude. So, so it's, it's not like a runner's high. You take testosterone and boom, you're way up here. No. It's an elevator yeah. that makes your basic operational condition better mm-hmm. so you're not as likely to be depressed. Right. But in, in many ways... It is like a runner's high. It increases your endorphins. It increases your dopamine. It increases your um, uh, norepinephrine. So it does increase those neurotransmitters, but it doesn't happen like boom. It just, it just, as we give it, testosterone slowly goes up and mood slowly gets better, but it's not a high. It's just, you're back to your normal self. If you were always kind of muted and not happy, Mm -hmm. then you'll get back to there. Yeah. You're not going to be, you know, the ebullient person that just starts telling jokes because you're taking testosterone. <laughs> it's not that. It's well, I'll you, be able to play the piano. You go, yeah, yeah, you go back to your normal self. Right. So it's not, it's not, you're not going to become your neighbor who's the life of the party. You're just, you know, you're going to be yourself. So we talk about depression and anxiety as being comorbid, meaning mm-hmm. that they frequently occur simultaneously. Mm-hmm. One usually gets the attention because it's the more predominant display. Mm-hmm. And so people who are depressed, diagnosed as depressed, put on medicine for depression, Mm -hmm. if that improves their condition, frequently what happens is the anxiety that's been hiding under the Mm -hmm. depression comes out. Mm -hmm. So then they focus on anxiety. Mm -hmm. Then they're taking drugs for both. Yeah, that's that's common. But but sometimes anxiety happens, especially to men who whose testosterone drops yeah. and then their FSH and LH the two hormones from their brain start surging and when women have that surge we get hot flashes when men have it surge they get it's anxiety attacks, attacks. Yeah. and they've never had one before and they are so, totally like incapacitated by these attacks cuz they don't know when well, they're going to come because we've always been taught there has to be a reason you know do you have a big contract that you have to mm-hmm. get uh, is it time for your yearly evaluation is your kid well, sick? Well, it could be Is triggered by those related? things, but sometimes it just happens. Yeah. And you have no warning, and it just happens because those surges happen without without any kind of stimulation. It just happens because you don't have enough testosterone. Those surges are trying to push the testicles to make more testosterone. Right. And if it can't make more, it won't turn those off. Right. So when we give testosterone back to those gentlemen, their anxiety goes, Phew. Yeah. And they're, they don't need anti-anxiety agents. They don't want to, most of these guys don't want to take them because it, it n- kind of numbs them, mm-hmm. makes them feel tired. They don't want to feel more tired because their testosterone is already low. So when we give them testosterone, they have more energy and they, uh, they basically don't have the worry about becoming anxiety ridden every time they go to work. Okay. So now so I'm not going to have one. diabetes. I'm not going to have anxiety. I'm not going to have depression. I didn't say you're not going to have kill. depression. Yeah. Just wait a second, because you, you, if you've had depression your whole life, yeah. this isn't going to fix it. Right. You've always had it. It doesn't mean that your testosterone was low your whole life. I'm talking about the depression that gets better with testosterone because it got worse because your testosterone went down. Yes. Okay, so now... So, so now, but my now, question is, okay, I've, I've backed away from the edge of all these problems. What about cholesterol? Okay, so interestingly enough, I have a lot of doctors that go, oh, don't take testosterone. It's going to raise your cholesterol, which is just the opposite of what it does. Really? Because t- when we give testosterone, LDL, the bad cholesterol, drops. There is some mechanism, and I can't tell you what that mechanism is, and I'm not sure that we know, that cholesterol makes testosterone. So when we give testosterone back, it has a feedback system to the liver to not make as much cholesterol. Okay, so the cholesterol normally would be produced, get into the blood, it would go to the testicles, make testosterone, and be used up. When you're not making a lot of testosterone, the factory's kind of been shut down partially, Mm -hmm. then there's cholesterol building up. So I can usually tell when somebody has had their critical testosterone level hit is when, I mean, is when their cholesterol level went up and their doctor put them on statins. Yes. That's usually my key to if somebody goes, well, I don't know how long I've had this. I said, well, when did you go on a statin? And then they remember that. And a lot of your patients who get pellets come off of their statins. Yeah, they do. Not because you take them off. No, but but they don't need them. Because their physician discovers we don't need this anymore. They don't need them anymore. If they were on a statin, there's other reasons to be on a statin for a high LDL. 
then they can often come off a statin. But just like my husband's been on a statin since he was 40, and he shouldn't come off because he's got some plaque. So, yeah. yeah. So that's that's one of those things where I, he shouldn't come off of that, well, but, but his doctor important. doesn't want him to come off. And, and that's a good example because you don't operate alone. When mm-hmm. you do what you do, you mm-hmm. try to do that in consultation with their regular physician who, who's treating them for other things. Mm-hmm. If that physician is amenable to hearing from you mm-hmm. and to considering what you have to offer, sometimes they are not. You, you've had doctors yeah. panic and say, oh, my God, she's going to kill you. Uh, <laughs> and but you've and they won, usually get a new doctor. You've won <laughs> a number of those another. doctors over mm-hmm. because they sent you resistant cases and hard-to-cure mm-hmm. cases people that they became concerned about that they couldn't impact. Mm-hmm. And they said, well, what the heck? Try this. <laughs> yeah. she, she, can't, she may kill you. But, I had uh, that last week. Yeah. It was really interesting. And, and it happened. always feels really good mm-hmm. when one of them sees the light and says, you know, I was wrong. Yeah. And, it's, it's, and, very, it's very nice. And so it's they exciting send for their patients. Their family members. Yeah, they do. It's, it's really funny that, I mean, I just have to keep trying to respect their part of the um, medical care because – you don't just get testosterone and just go off your medicines. That would be an, a terrible mistake. Yes. You, If you get better, then your primary doctor will see that you're better. Your blood pressure is lower. You've lost weight. You don't need that much blood pressure medicine. Or you can get off one of them. Or you can get off uh, or you can decrease your dose. But your doctor should be able to see that course, and My wife and I avoid it. that whole conundrum by seeing a physician that is also one of your patients. Yes. Who gets <laughs> So yeah, we don't have to have it. those conversations. She gets it, but you're off your like three drugs. Yeah. You went off three drugs when when you've and been I on lost the pellets. You lost weight. You're yeah. not diabetic. You're you know. It, yeah. I mean, a lot of things reverse. And so, I mean, that's my. You're my best billboard. So, <laughs> <laughs> so well, that, those are. Well, if I'm the best billboard, let's talk about breast cancer. Okay. Because breast cancer is one of the things that people are terrified of, mainly because of the erroneous, uh, fallacious. Women's Health uh, Report. Initiative. Yeah, initiative. Where wh- everybody got a scare. And they said, oh, my God, it's killing women. They're all getting breast cancer. They're going to die. <laughs> and if you've got a woman that you love and care about, you're afraid of her getting breast cancer. Right. Legitimately mm-hmm. so. So you don't want to do anything that's going to expose her or increase her risk. So now the question comes, does testosterone replacement cause breast cancer? No. Testosterone replacement actually improves your immune system. It makes it more active against cancer cells. So it stimulates the number of T cells that you have. T cells kill cancer cells and some bacteria and viruses and things like that, but cancer cells. And it also increases T helper cells, which help those T cells. And then it also decreases the risk of all kinds of cancer. So testosterone is a to a, a cancer lowering kind of Preventive hormone. or avoidant. Right, but not what if, an elevator. What if my wife has already been diagnosed with breast cancer? If she's already been do- diagnosed with breast cancer, if she does not have estrogen receptors, she can still take estrogen and testosterone. If she has estrogen receptors, because of the powers that be, we don't use, we don't give estrogen, but we do give testosterone. Testosterone does not cause breast cancer. Testosterone decreases So how do you decide if she has cancer. estrogen receptors? They tell you that. The, the breast cancer doctor There's a will test. give you the, uh, the records and they say estrogen receptors, progesterone receptors. So if they have estrogen receptors, then they're usually placed on tamoxifen or um, arimidex or an aromatase inhibitor, um, which is fine. And we can't, and they usually allow us to give testosterone because it's been shown to decrease the risk of recurrence. So it shouldn't just panic over the idea of breast cancer and say, oh, well, I can't do testosterone no. because in my family, there have been a number of oh, women. Oh, well, that- if it's in your family, it depends on how far it was in your family. And, and what else? I mean, estrogen is not the biggest risk for breast cancer. If you really are worried about breast cancer, then you will be at ideal weight. You will stop being obese. I mean, that's the biggest risk for breast cancer is obesity. Yes. Because it makes a lot of, in your fat, you make estrone. Estrone is that old lady estrogen. That's bad for breast cancer, not young women's estrogen, what we give in menopause. So being fat is the highest risk. Also having diabetes is another risk. so many of the things that kills us. Yeah, and drinking too much alcohol, that's another risk. 
So, I mean, these are the biggest risks, risks that way outweigh estrogen. I mean, and estrogen has not really been found to cause breast cancer. In fact, in the last year, they've come out with a lot of studies showing that. They do say they don't, they aren't sure if it feeds the cancers and makes it grow. There have been a lot of studies recently that have said, so in 2018, they've come out and said, we aren't even sure if it's, you know, makes it grow more. Maybe there are other factors that right. cause that. So it, they're not sure. something else going on here. Right. So, right. so they're looking for other factors. Yes. But it was just a slam dunk to say, oh, it's estrogen. It's a breast, so it's estrogen. So it's, you know, right. that was just kind of a logical conclusion, but not one that has been borne up in uh, research. Okay. Well, there are also other diseases that we didn't have time to get to today that, that we know that testosterone can reduce the risk of occurrence or minimize the impact of occurrence. Hopefully, you will be stimulated by this conversation to look at your own situation as you age and in consultation with your physician, make the determination that uh, testosterone replacement, hormone replacement might be something that would offer you a better way of life as you go forward. As always, thank you for listening. Thank you. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.